distinguished guests, good afternoon. It is an honor to be here at the 28th Forbes Global CEO Conference. I'm glad to see this return to physical meeting after a gap of almost three years. Zooming in and out of virtual meetings, hanging out with Google, or teaming up with Microsoft made me feel like I was permanently in the cloud. I could not be happier to see we are back to where I can actually stand on earth between an audience and their lunch. We all realize that the last few decades have been a time of a remarkable economic growth for the world. In this context, the conference theme, the way forward, is fascinating. Because the lenses through which you and I define the way forward may not be the same anymore. In my view, Globalization is at an inflection point. It will, it will look very different from what we had come to accept in a largely unipolar world. Many of us, including I, bought into Thomas Fredman's socioeconomic business model that claim the world is flat. We had started believing that the digital revolutions mark the end of borders. We accepted that market deregulations and economic integrations had set an emotions, a gravity defying era of an unlimited economic progress. This seemed to be a logical summary of a borderless and limitless growth. Who would have imagined that our world would change in just 36 months? The unprecedented complexity created by a parallel surge in demand and a contractions in supply is leading to inflation levels that have not been seen over the past 40 years. Many federal banks are considering the unthinkable raising interest rates so much that they can crash an economy into recessions. This is an unthinkable reality today. On top of all of this, a war that has implications well beyond its borders, accelerating climate change challenges and runaway inflation means we are in uncharted waters. And the sales of this story are still unfolding. All of this is leading to a massive realignment of our nation ecosystems. We have seen it with the ratification for adding new NATO members, the rolling out of Abram Accord in West Asia, our Ring fan Central Asia wanting to have more control over their own destiny and so on. 
we must recognize that we are now witnessing a new set of geopolitical couplings as we transition into a multipolar world. What I see ahead are the new principles of a global engagement based on a greater self-reliance, lower supply chain risk, and a stronger nationalism. Some have called this the rising tide of deglobalization. Therefore, the question is, where does this leave India? In my view, the global turbulence has accelerated opportunities for India. It has made India one of the few relatively bright spots from a political, geostrategic, and a market perspective. The term relatively is important because Europe's conditions have only gotten more difficult. The ongoing armed conflict has accelerated its structural weaknesses, balancing the aspiration levels of the EU's members' country and still keeping the EU united will be harder than ever before. The United Kingdom continues to slide as it struggles with Brexit and a new set of hard to optimize economic challenges. Also, I anticipate that China that was seen as the foremost champion of globalization will feel increasingly isolated. Increasing nationalism, supply chain risk mitigations, and technology restrictions will have an impact. China's Belt and Road Initiative was expected to be a demonstration of his global ambitions, but the resistance now makes it challenging. And his housing and credit risk are drawing comparisons with what happened to the Japanese economy during the last decade of the 1990s. While I expect all these economies will readjust over time, and bounce back. The friction of the bounce back looks far harder this time. Now, talking about India, I will be the first to admit that we are far from perfect. However, I will also claim that the essence of India's democracy lies in his imperfections. What many see as India's imperfections reflects a thriving and a noisy democracy. Only the free can afford to make noise, to have their imperfections visible. To overmanage this, would be to destroy India's unique ability to express its diversity. The fact is, India has just become the world's fifth largest economy. The fact is, India is on the path to be the world's third largest economy by 2030. The fact is, India's real growth is just starting. As it goes from its 75th year of freedom this year towards its 100th year of independence. 
our country call this period as a amrit kal meaning the perfect period for beginning a better tomorrow let me now envision the next 25 years over this period india will comfortably become a country with a 100% literacy levels india will also be a poverty free well before 2050 we will be a country with a median age of just 38 years even in 2050 and a country with the largest consuming middle class the world will ever see will also be the country that attracts the highest level of foreign direct investment given the sheer scale of a consumption of 1.6 billion people we will be the country that will go from a 3 trillion dollar economy to a 30 trillion dollar economy a country with a stock market capitalizations of a 45 trillion dollar and a country that will be supremely confident of his position in the world let's double click some more on the trends following our independence it took india almost 58 years to reach the 1 trillion dollar gdp mark it then took 12 years to achieve our second trillion dollar and thereafter only 5 years to achieve third trillion dollars this rate will further accelerate as the digital revolutions kicks in and transform every type of activity at a national scale we are already witness to this in 2021 india added a unicorn every 9 days and it executed the largest number of real time financial transactions globally a staggering 48 billion this was 3 times greater than china and 6 times greater than the us canada france and germany combined india is now on the cusp of a creating several thousands of entrepreneurs while many will not make it to success the sheer learnings and momentum of the youth will mean that the pace of unicorn creations in india is set to accelerate and for every unicorn that rises we will see the birth of dozens of micro unicorns in fact india is already world hottest ground for the new ideas of the 760 districts in india over 670 have at least one registered startup a smartphone and a inexpensive data mixed with aspirations makes the most potent mix to transform a nation and the digitally enabled india's journey is just beginning while this journey of india's growth to date has been driven largely by domestic investment we recognize that the economy needs both domestic as well as foreign direct investment last year india recorded its highest annual fdi inflow of 85 billion dollars in this ongoing year the inflow is expected to cross 100 billion dollars 
thereby setting another record. In fact, India's FDI inflow have increased over 20-fold since the year 2000. There could be no better sign of the increasing global confidence in India. I expect the flow of FDI into India to further accelerate and rise above $500 billion over the next 15 years, making India by far the world's fastest growing destinations for FDI. This confidence of a nation is also reflected in the scale of the decisions corporates make. This has been the case with the Adani Group as we benefit from a rising India. In this context, let me outline the primary areas that will define our strategic directions, both within India and then beyond India's border. At the top is the energy transitions followed by a digital transformations. As a group, we will invest over 100 billion of our capital in the next decade. We have earmarked 70% of this investment for the energy transition space. We are already the world's largest solar player, and we intend to do far more. In this context, Adani New Industries is the manifestations of the bet we are making in the energy transition space. It is our commitment to invest $70 billion in an integrated green hydrogen-based value chain. Therefore, in addition to our existing 20 gigawatt renewable portfolios, the new business will be augmented by another 45 gigawatt of hybrid renewable power generation spread over 100,000 hectares of land, an area 1.4 times that of Singapore. This will lead to commercialization of a 3 million metric tons of a green hydrogen. This multifold business will see us build three gigafactories in India. We are in the process of a building a 10 gigawatt silicon-based photovoltaic value chain that will be backward integrated from a raw silicon to our solar panels, a 10 gigawatt integrated wind turbine manufacturing facilities, and a 5 gigawatt hydrogen electrolyzer factory. Today, we can confidently state that we have a line of sight to first become one of the least expensive producer of the green electron, and thereafter, the least expensive producer of a green hydrogen. It is an absolute game changer for India, and opens up the unprecedented possibility that India could one day become a net energy exporter. However, while we undertake this uniquely ambitious energy transition journey, we are also making sure that our goals stay equitable with the national needs. Critics would have us instantly get rid of all fossil fuels that India needs to service large populations. This would not work for India. 
even today india with a 16% of the world's populations accounts for less than 7% on co2 emissions and this ratio continues to fall therefore let me echo what mr steve forbes himself said just a few days ago quote amazingly no one did their homework to figure out what was involved in replacing fossil fuels with alternative energy sources nor did they factor in what would happen if the sun didn't shine or the wind didn't blow unquote no one could have said it any better next our ambitions in the space of digital transformations also seek to benefit from the energy transitions adjacency the indian data center market is witnessing explosive growth this sector consumes more energy than any other industries in the world and therefore our move to build a green data centers is a game changing differentiator we will interconnect these data centers through a series of terrestrial and a globally linked undersea cables drawn at our ports and build consumer based super apps that will bring the hundreds of millions of adanis b2 b2c consumers on one common digital platform once done the monetization possibilities are endless we also just finish building the world largest sustainability cloud that already has a hundred of our solar and wind sites running on it all of a single giant command and control center that will soon be augmented by a global ai lab these are just a few of the adjacencies that are being mainstreamed at our digital businesses at adani while i have focus on adani's renewable and digital businesses the adani group function as a set of adjacent businesses that act like a giant network the adjacency based business model defines the crux of our strategic directions let me elaborate we are the largest airport operator in the nations with a 25% of passenger traffic and a 40% of a air cargo we are the largest ports and a logistic company in india with a 30% of national market share we are india's largest integrated energy player spanning electricity generations transmission and distributions lng and lpg terminals city gas and pipe gas distributions we are now the highest valued fmcg company following the ip ipo of adani wilmar we have declared our path forward in a multiple new sectors that includes data centers super apps industrial clouds aerospace and defense metals and petrochemicals we are the country's second largest cement manufacturers our market cap stands at 260 billion dollars having grown faster than any company ever in india the point i would like to make it 
is that India is full of incredible opportunities. The real India growth story is just starting. This is the base window for companies to embrace India's economic resurgence and the incredible multi-decade tailwind the world's largest and a most youthful democracy offers. India's next three decades will be the most defining years for the impact it will have on the world. Let me conclude by saying that my view comes from being an incurable optimist. This optimism is the wind in my sails that has made us India's most valued business. It is the fire that flames my belief in the India's growth story. It is the blue in the sky that Indians believe to be the symbol of the limitless. A democracy whose time has come cannot be stopped and India's time has arrived. I sincerely believe this can only be a good news for the global order. India is an economically successful democracy that leads by example. What we do in the short term will look like a marathon. What we achieve in the long run will look like a sprint. Yes, the seas will be turbulent, but the optimist in me prefers the turbulence that raises us to greatness or the stillness that would lower us to mediocrity. I invite you to bet on India and embrace India's aspirations